Okay, for this week's UNESCO World Heritage Site, I'm here on the windswept Isle of Orkney, looking at its Neolithic heart. Located off the north coast of Scotland, the Orkneys are an archipelago of over 60 islands and are actually closer to the Arctic Circle than they are to London. Now, Orkney is special because it has one of the highest concentrations of Neolithic monuments of anywhere in Europe. Now, the first Orcadians reached the islands in the Mesolithic around about 9,000 years ago and were quite possibly refugees fleeing the flooding of Doggerland in the North Sea as the sea levels were rising at the end of the last glaciation. The Mesolithic people were mostly hunter-gatherers, but around about 5,000 years ago we started to get the Neolithic farming revolution hit the British Isles, and the landscape starts to change as the Neolithic people started to chop down the forests and to start building per more permanent settlements. Orkney. The reason why Orkney has such a wealth of Neolithic monuments, there are well over 100 across the, across the islands, is largely down to two factors. First off is the actions of these Neolithic farmers in chopping down the forests that would have covered Orkney at the time that they arrived. Because the Orkney Islands aren't a particularly big area, they essentially ran out of wood fairly early on in the Neolithic. And this is shown from the various pollen analyses that have been done at the various sites across the, the archipelago. The second reason why we've got so many monuments is down to the geology of the Orkney Islands themselves. It is dominated by Devonian sandstones and these sandstones happen to split quite easily across their bedding planes, allowing you to make large slabs of stone really quite relatively easily, without a lot of effort in chiselling and hammering away at them. With the absence of the forests, the ancient Orcadians resorted to using the natural stone to build their monuments, and because of that we actually have a wealth of Neolithic structures in Orkney. Whereas across the rest of the British Isles, these monuments would have been made out of wood, and subsequently rotted away, giving us very little evidence to work with. In 1999, UNESCO designated the Heart of Neolithic Orkney as a World Heritage Site, and it's focused largely around four monuments at two locations. In the Nessel Brogge, you've got the Ringer Brogge, you've got the Stones of Stannis, and Maze Howe, and then about eight kilometres away, on the coast, you've also got the village of Skara Bray. Starting off with what is the oldest part of the UNESCO World Heritage Site, we're at the Stones of Stannis. Now, as far as stone circles go, this might not necessarily be the most impressive one. The site contains only a handful of stones now, although originally it was at least 11. They're made from the local Devonian sandstones, which split quite nicely and also give these rather unique diagonal tops to them. It's just a natural feature of the fracturing of the rock, but it does give these Orcadian stone circles a somewhat unique feel that is not really seen anywhere else in the British Isles. The stone circle originally would have been around 30 metres in diameter, with an associated henge around the outside. From the north end of the henge there was a causeway that would have crossed it to allow access to the interior of the circle. Now, as is typical for a lot of the Neolithic monuments and certainly with the henges and stone circles throughout Western Europe, we don't really have a clear understanding of exactly what was taking place within these stone circles. It's safe to assume that there was some sort of ceremonial purpose the exact nature of that we are largely uncertain. We know it does align to the solstices, both the winter and summer solstices and a lot of the henges and stone circles that we've got throughout the rest of Britain. So there's a possibility that it is related to some sort of either calendar counting or astronomical observation or ritual or worship. At Stennis there is actually a central half that was discovered which is a fairly unusual feature. Most of the other cer ceremonial circles don't have this kind of structure in there. And just outside the original entrance to the henge, there was a small arrangement of upright stones 
known as the Dolmen, and Victorian antiquarians assumed that this was some sort of heathen altar, and they took a stone that was actually flat on the ground and put it, erected it on top of two other stones to make what they thought was some sort of altar. This is now considered to be incorrect, and that actually the Dolmen was not a table, but was one of the other stones that formed a part of the circle. Perhaps the most special feature about the stones of Stennis is their age. There is a little uncertainty to to do with the archaeological record around Stennis, but it appears that the stone circle was initially constructed sometime around about 5,400 years ago. Now to put that into comparison, the main stone circle at Stonehenge, the Sarsen stones, was constructed a thousand years after that. In fact, stone, the Stones of Stennis is actually the oldest surviving stone circle that we have anywhere within Europe. So it suggests that this site was quite important ceremonial very, very early, early on within the Neolithic. And although this is largely conjecture, there's a possibility that the Stone Circle culture, the Atlantic coast of Europe, might have had its origins here on the Orkney Islands. A little over a kilometre to the east of the Stones of Stennis is the burial chamber of Maze Howe. The Maze Howe was built around about 5,000 years ago, so potentially slightly after the Stones of Stennis, although, as I said, Stennis does have some uncertainty as to its age. Then now there are well over 70 burial chambers across Orkney of wide varieties, but Maze Howe is by far the largest and the most impressive that you'll find on the islands. The Maze House sits on top of a clay platform that was flattened out prior to the construction of the burial chamber. And archaeological excavations have suggested this platform may precede Maze House by several hundred years, meaning this might have been a prior ceremonial site or certainly a place of special significance to the local people of Orkney before they built the burial chamber. Around this, there is a ditch. Now, this is somewhat unique amongst the, amongst the burial chambers not just in Orkney but across the British Isles, that most Neolithic burial chambers don't have a ditch around them. It almost mirrors a the ditch that you find that forms part of a hinge that goes around many of the stone circles. Now this ditch had been dug out from the bed, natural bedrock and was flat bottomed and about two meters deep so it would have provided a quite prominent boundary around what was already a significant mound. We'll get to the interior structure shortly, but as you move outwards there was a series of walls buried inside the chamber that appear to have been used to help retain the soil and material that is being used to build the burial mound. And overlaid over the surface of this we have a layer of local yellow clay that was used to top off the structure and probably provide it some sort of water insulation. I'd also like to note that this would have been a rather paler structure with it being the yellow clay, contrasting with the natural greens and browns that would form part of the normal Arcadian landscape during the Neolithic. So again, this would have allowed the site to have been visible for quite a distance. The resulting mound is about 35 metres in diameter and about 7 metres high. As you enter Maze Howe, you go through a passageway that goes on for several metres into the interior main chamber. Now the contrast to the size of the mound outside, the actual main chamber is relatively small. It's only about 4.7 metres across in a roughly square pattern and about 4.5 metres tall. They were drying stone walls and were built from the massive slabs from the local Orcadian sandstone that as they, raised, as they built upwards to form the roof, they brought them in ever so slightly, a little, a little bit at a time, allowing the creation of a roof that wasn't going to collapse in on itself. Off the main chamber there are three separate side chambers from this tomb and these are made again the same fashion of the, of the various layers of stone. Most of them though however are made from single slabs to form the floor, each wall and the ceiling of them. These are fairly large slabs, these chambers by comparison to the main chamber are not particularly large and sort of these areas were the main depositories of the remains of the dead. One special significant feature about Maze Howe, amongst the many others, is that at sunset on the midwinter solstice 
the sunlight is angled right to go straight down the passageway and illuminate the interior of the main central chamber. Was this deliberate? Most likely. The significance of this? Uncertain. Again, we're talking about a culture and a religion that has left us no written records, so we don't really know the thoughts process that was going behind a lot of these people and was it done purely for aesthetic purposes or was it done because it related to some sort of belief in the renewal of midwinter you know, midwinter festivals are quite a common thing across the northern hemisphere linked around concepts of renewal and rebirth so it might have had something to do with this but the honest truth is we without any kind of record of these people's own beliefs it's going to be impossible to tell so what was found in Mays How? Actually not a lot. And this logic comes down to the fact that Mays How had been raided on a number of occasions. Most notably in the Viking era, when a bunch of Norsemen managed to break into the chamber, scored some graffiti on the walls and bragged about how they'd come away with great treasure from the burial tomb. And the reality is we know from other Neolithic burial chambers that you tend to just find bones. You don't. There's not like there's a lot of wealth of, of of weapons and jewelry and and gold and silver and things like that. Things that the Vikings would have considered of of high value, found in these tombs. So it, there is the possibility that these Viking tomb raiders had actually stumbled across a much more recent burial and thought that maybe a previous Viking had used the tomb as their own burial chamber. And it was that that these Viking graffiti artists were bragging about raiding. The truth is, is that we haven't found a lot in the way of human remains from from Maze Howe. There's only a few scraps of bone. We can infer from the other cairns that have been found across the Orkney Islands, though, that there likely would have been the remains of dozens, if not hundreds, of individuals buried within inside these chambers. In the nearby chamber cairn of Quatanes, around about 10 kilometres away, archaeologists have found the remains of 157 individuals of all different ages and estimated that it originally could have held at least 400 people. So, to give you an idea of what was happening inside these burial mounds. One of the things that has been noted in the burial mounds, not just on Orkney but in other places throughout the British Isles, is bodies of the deceased aren't just left to rest, they get moved around inside the burial chambers as new people are brought in and in particular the case of the burial chamber known as the Tomb of the Eagles, they found that the remains had been piled up so in one side you had all the leg bones, in another one you had all the skulls and the vertebrae in another corner and things like that, so the possibility that the people that were buried in Mace were buried in a similar fashion. That the remains were disturbed and rearranged as was seen fit by the locals. As far as we can tell, Maze Howe is the only Neolithic tomb that had been disturbed by the Vikings and probably disturbed the only Neolithic tomb that was disturbed by many of the people prior to modern archaeology and the antiquarian era where people started to take an interest in ancient monuments. Moving away from the Nessa Brogna briefly, we're going over to the Bear Skull where we've got Skara Bray. And Skara Bray is a fantastic Neolithic village and a rather unique site upon the Orkney Islands. And this is partly because of the state of preservation that Skara Bray was in, but also it contains a few new unique features in itself, such as the fact that the passageways between the houses were eventually deliberately covered over to provide a covered walkway in between each of the buildings rather than having the passageways exposed to the elements. Skara Bay was originally started to be inhabited around about 2900 BC, so just under 5000 years ago, so slightly after the building of Mays Howe and the Stones of Stennis. And the village continued to be lived in consistently for around about six to seven hundred years. The village itself provides us with a very unique understanding of what was taking place within regular Orkney life for the people. 5,000 years ago. And it's partly because of the state of preservation and it was able to be preserved in such a unique state because shortly after the village's abandonment it appears to have been covered by sand and buried underneath the sand dune and it wasn't until a storm in 1850 
that tore away a lot of the sand dune that the local landowner William Watt actually realised that this built that this Neolithic village was just a couple of hundred metres from his house. Later excavations, starting in 1861 by James Farrer, would ultimately show the full extent of the site. The village itself comprises of ten buildings, nine of which are houses and one of which, known as Structure 8, appears to be a workshop. The houses themselves show a remarkable amount of uniformity, suggesting that this may be a community with strong ties that was also hinted at maybe it might have even been a religious centre or some sort of strong cultural centre in which conformity was heavily emphasised. The houses themselves all contain a rather spacious open area in the middle with a hearth at the centre that will be used for cooking and for keeping people warm. Bear in mind this is northern Scotland, winters can then and now be quite harsh. Off the sides of these were, were stalls that had bed chambers that would have been filled with bedding for the people to sleep in and directly opposite the entranceway to each of these houses was also a wonderful set of shelves that housed the various items that were belonged to the household. Personal items, often pottery, things like that was kept on these shelves. And most of the houses also contained small little side chambers that would have been used for storage. They're not really big enough for anything else really. So this can suggest that the local people actually had a considerable amount of stuff more than anything else. You don't build storage space unless you actually have things to store. What is noticeable is that unlike a lot of the long houses that you'd find in other parts of the British Isles, these small stone structures don't really have any capacity for holding animals so this was definitely just a human habitation. Animals would have been kept further outside in pens or fenced off or stone built wall fields for them. It's thought that the population themselves that lived at Scarabray survived on eating animal products, mostly cattle sheep and pigs as well as fishing from the local area. We know this largely down to the fact that there are substantial middens in the area and a midden is a basically a waste heap. So once people had eaten their animals, worked with the flint or whatever other kind of waste, it was basically their garbage dump and they would put this material in a certain spot. And these middens have been great for the archaeologists because it just shows the remains of day-to-day -day life basically it gives you an idea of what people were eating, what people were doing there. Contrary to popular myth, Scarabray was not a subterranean village. The houses would have been roofed over with what little wood was available and covered it either with thatched or turf material to help keep out the, the wind that is, if you've ever been to Orkney, is quite prevalent on the Orkney Islands. And at a later date, not too long before the abandonment of the village, the passageways in between each of the, these buildings was covered over with stone, with a stone roof that would allow the inhabitants to enter from one end of the village and move into their respective residence without being exposed to the elements. This suggests that the weather might have been becoming a little less agreeable to people. Now sadly Sadly, we don't actually know how extensive the village of Scarabray was. We certainly know that it was bigger than its current state. In 1927, a storm came through that damaged and took away a considerable portion of the village that it already that was already aware of, leaving us with the structures that we've got now. Coastal erosion is still a significant threat to Scarabray, and there are erosional defences in place to help protect the village. So why was Scarabray abandoned? The reality is we don't actually know. We know it wasn't the result of an attack. There is no level of destruction involved with the houses. There's not like a burnt layer or something like that if the buildings were burned down. We haven't got any the remains of people there that would have been the result of an attack 
or even a sudden natural disaster. You know, there would be people that have been killed by such an event. We haven't found the remains of them either. So it's likely that the people leaving Scarabray left of their own accord and left for reasons that meant that the village was no longer a suitable place to live. It could be that the encroaching of the sea from the coastal erosion made them realise that maybe perhaps the village didn't have long left. Maybe the advancement of the sand dunes wasn't, was not just a one-off sudden event but had been progressing slowly. It's thought that perhaps the windblown sand had started to contaminate the local pastures that they were using to feed their animals and that this had meant that it was no longer viable to raise their herds at that site anymore. The sad reality is, is that we'll probably never know exactly what left these people to leave their homes. But fortunately for us, it does give us a wonderfully unique insight into the lives of people almost 5,000 years ago on Orkney. And this brings me to the fourth monument that's part of the UNESCO World Heritage Site, the Ring of Brodga. And the Ring of Brodga is actually the youngest of all the monuments, even though it was built sometime between 4,600 and 4,400 years ago. Still a significantly old building and still Neolithic. The Bronze Age hadn't quite reached the people of Orkney yet. Although we might look at these two monuments and think of them as being closely associated geographically, the reality is, is that almost a thousand years has passed between the constructions of the Stones of Stennis and the Ring of Brodga. The Ring of Brodga originally consisted of 60 stones, of which 36 currently survive. An interesting feature about these stones is that they actually come from different parts of the Orkney Islands. So this suggests that actually this is probably a large communal project, that you've, that you've got communities coming from across the archipelago, all to this one site, bringing their own pieces of local stone to erect to form this part of the stone circle. The stone circle itself is 104 metres in diameter, which to put that into comparison, the Sarsen stone circle at Stonehenge is only 33 metres in diameter. So this is a particularly wide stone circle, and in fact it is the third largest Neolithic stone circle in the world, beaten only by Karnak in Brittany, and Avebury, the largest one in the world. Around the stone circle is also the, the henge, the ditch and bank, a common feature of many of the stone circles. And the Ring of Brog itself has attracted interest for a long time, largely because it's so prominent on the landscape. It's, it's much higher up than a lot of the other monuments and is very visible on the, the Nessa Brog, this little isthmus of land in between these two locks. The earliest accounts of the Ring of Brogger go back to 1529 and this has provided archaeologists with a fantastic account of how people have perceived this monument over time and drawings and artwork have allowed archaeologists to help reconstruct the monuments in light of perhaps more recent damage. One of the local landowners Admittedly, this was for, for the Stones of Stennis rather than Brogger, but one of the local landowners very nearly ended up destroying the Stones of Stennis. So these pieces of artwork allow modern, more modern archaeologists to wind the clap, clock back a few centuries and help put the, stone, the stones back to where our earlier records find them, and potentially a more accurate representation of where they originally were. Although it is easy to suggest that their two stone circles, they fulfilled a similar function. The Ads is Brogga is in a much more prominent position and it's a much larger structure than the stones of Stennis, suggesting that they might have served two different purposes, or at least served purposes for two different communities. As I said, bear in mind that nearly a thousand years have passed between the construction of, of the two sites. Similar to pretty much every other stone circle in, in the British Isles, Again, we don't really know the true purpose of Brogga and what took place there. Sadly, this is one of the greatest mysteries of history, is that without the written records of these peoples, we don't really know with a great degree of certainty what took place there. And that's Neolithic Orkney.